start the announcements. Um, we do have a couple things that are going to be really fun happening here at Forest Hill. We have Singing Saints concert next Sunday at 3 p.m. The Singing Saints are a group um, that Cy Malden started many years ago. I don't even know how many years ago. Um, and they um, practice on Monday mornings in our fellowship center. And then um, they sing together. So it's, it's crazy after all this time to say, we're going to have a concert, but we're going to have a concert. And we're really excited about that. It's going to be in our main sanctuary next Sunday at 3 p.m. Also, if you need a booster, particularly if you need a fourth booster, so if you're 50 and older and you have had your last booster, it's been four months since your last booster, you now qualify for a fourth COVID booster. And we are going to have a COVID booster clinic on May the 15th. Um, here at the church in the afternoon, that's a Sunday, um, and there is a sign up in the email. So if you would like to be a part of that, just sign up and we'll make sure that we have everything covered for you. It'll be easy in and out like we have many, many times before. Um, and again, that's May the 15th. Um, we have lots of other things happening. I would say check your email. Um, if you're not on our email list, let us know. We are happy that you are joining us online this morning. If you are joining us online, there is a pinned comment and it has a link to our Connect card and also our giving link. So we say good morning to you. Um, feel free to share your prayer concerns in the comments this morning. So with all of that on our hearts and minds, I invite you to stand as we prepare for worship. Holy and loving Lord, we give you thanks for this beautiful day that you have created. We give you thanks for these moments that we come to set aside the things of our life to worship you. Lord, it is so good to be in worship this morning. And Lord, we ask that as we come to worship, that you send your Holy Spirit upon us to quiet our hearts and our minds so that we can offer you all of our worship and praise. All this we ask in the strong and faithful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Rescue my sin was heavy, but 
joints break at the way of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together in this place to love and worship you with our voices, with our hearts. We give you thanks for this Easter season that we're in, for your love shared with us, with all of us. We give you thanks for your grace, the ways that we experience you day in and day out in our lives. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Um, some prayer concerns that I'd like to lift up to you this morning. If you notice, we are missing someone up here this morning. Wes, Pastor Wes, of, has tested positive for COVID. So he is quarantining and we're praying for him. It's kind of a, a 
bad cold and he sounds kind of nasty. He said he just has lots of mucus and um, he's a little tired. So um, we lift him up in prayer and miss him greatly this morning. We continue to pray for Wally Boswell. Uh, Becky Berenger is doing well and we give thanks that she's recovering. We saw her this week and she was perky and um, still not able to put weight on her legs, but she is doing well. Ulysses Green, we heard from him, and he is in Apex recovering um, and undergoing his continued dialysis and hoping to get back home very soon, so that's great news. Um, we continue to pray for Harold and Betty Falls, for Dory as she recovers for her foot. Joshua Glenn, uh, we pray for Shirley Taylor, Bruce's mom um, in Florida, and she's, um, she's doing a little better, and so we give praise for that, but still a long journey. Uh, we also lift up David Buckland. He's the 13-year-old son of Sue Ann Buckland, um, and he was diagnosed with leukemia last week, and he is um, going to undergo 28 days of chemo, and that's a whole lot for a 13-year-old, so we lift up that family. So with all those things on our hearts, let's, um, let us pray together. Lord, you call us to be people of faith, and yet oftentimes we are people with doubts. We doubt that love can grow again in relationships where anger and bitterness reign supreme. You know the strength of love and the power of prayer, so help us to be people who love well. We doubt that peace can come in the places in the world that are in tension, where hatred and racism reign supreme, and yet you know there are seeds of peace growing there. Help us to be faithful peacemakers. We doubt that the hungry can be fed across the world where despair and hopelessness reign, and yet you know there is enough food in the world. Help us to be generous and faithful. You, Lord, specialize in impossibilities. You walked on water. You healed the nations. You forgive sins. You set the captive free, and you set us free from our captivities. We pray, though, we pray for those this morning who are hurting and who are sick. We pray that they will feel your comfort and your presence with them. We especially lift up to you Wally and Becky, Ulysses and Harold and Betty, Dory and Joshua and Shirley and David and Wes. We pray that they may feel your healing touch. This morning we pray for the people who are filled, filled with doubts, who wonder whether you exist or whether you are listening to our prayers who wonder what this whole community thing is all about. We pray for those who doubt the purpose of life, who face feelings of meaningless, meaninglessness and despair. And even, Lord, we pray for those who have a sinking feeling, who need you in this time. May they turn to you for wisdom. Lord, we want to believe. Help our unbelief. Give us faith, small as a mustard seed, so that we can be your faithful people, believing in your power to save, believing in your power to reign supreme, believing that we can share this good news with everyone that we meet. Meet us where we are, encourage our hearts, and strengthen our faith. Unite us in love and mercy as we pray, as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So today we get to do something really wonderful and special. Um, we are bringing Camden into the church through confirmation. So I invite Camden and his moms to come up. Camden is a part of our confirmation class, and um, they were not able to be here on the day that we joined the other confirmands. And so today is Camden's very special day. Uh, he gets to do it all by himself, which he's thrilled about. Uh, he gets all the attention and all the spotlight. So, Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and are given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. 
through confirmation and through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. I present to you Camden Michael Linker Lowry. He is in eighth grade at JN Freeze. If you know anything about him, you know he is all about sports and basketball and baseball. And if you haven't seen him here, he's probably at the gym at Kerr Street practicing. Uh, Camden is the son of Angie and Sheila, and his, his mentor for confirmation was Pastor Mandy. Camden, I ask you, on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you? I do. Do you accept the freedom and the power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to all people of all ages, nations, and races? Do you? I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? Will you? I will. And to the congregation, I ask you, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include Camden now before you in your care? With God's, with God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Camden with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his trust of God and be found faithful in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in a way that leads to life. Camden, kneel down, please. Camden, remember your baptism. Be thankful. You can touch the water. Y'all can come up and put your hands on him. Camden Michael, the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water in the Spirit, that you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, stand up and turn around. We're going to scoot around here. As a member of Christ Universal Church, Camden, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries, will you? As a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, will you? Members of the household of God, I commend Camden to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given to you and welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in its ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So during this confirmation season, our church has been holding me in our prayers. Um, each week, as we mentioned, our mentors and our confirmands, um, we've held you close and we pray for you as a church and as a church that you are a part of. And so as a gift from the church to you, we have a Bible that has a letter in it from you and from to you uh, from me and your mentor. So I have to tell you that this is always a holy moment, right? I say that so much. This is a holy moment, and it really is. But um, Camden was baptized right here, right here. And we were all here. 
Um, and I wrote in his Bible that um, Sheila and Angie stood up here and they, um, they committed to lead him on a way that leads to life. And so today they stand here in a different place. They have done their work. They have raised him. They have held him in this special place. Um, and I'm going to try to make Angie cry. If I keep talking, I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> And they took this vow, but today Camden is standing before us and he's saying, no, I'm taking this vow. You have done your work well. And so it is a beautiful day of celebration. And I can't help but just think of what all we have been through in this, in this space and in this time. And Camden, I'm so proud of you. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm proud of your moms too. They did good work. This is a good family and love them dearly. So it is a day of celebration for us all. So thank you for being a part. So our offertory scripture goes right along with that. Um, it comes from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, goodbye. Put things in order. Respond to my encouragement. Be in harmony with each other and live in peace. And the God of love and peace be with you. So kind of thinking about all the things that I just said and so many things that happened in my life, this image of community has been such an important part of the last few weeks. I thrive in community. This past week, I went to a conference meeting. I have not been to a conference meeting gathered with other pastors in so long. We did not know what to do with each other. Put a whole bunch of pastors in a room together and then try to get their attention after they hadn't seen each other for two years. It was quite a feat. It was really wonderful to share a meal, to sneak a hug, um, and to talk about the United Methodist Church. And I was reminded um, in both word and feeling in that moment why I love the United Methodist Church. We are people of community and connection. We are in this together. We confirmed Camden. We um, stood as he affirmed his commitment to Christ. And we said, we are your people. We are your church. We are your community. You are a part of us, and that is important. When we give our gifts to God, we give them first and foremost to the glory of God, but we do it in worship and we do it because we are a community, because we are connected together, because we believe that what we do together is vitally important to the world and to the message of Christ. One of the greatest gifts to me about church, it truly is community. To be in a place where I can share life and love, where I am valued and accepted, where I am challenged and sent into the world to be love, where I have a soft place to land and to be nurtured. I am thankful for the gift of community. I am thankful that we are in this together. I am thankful that we praise God, that we put our resources together and we say we want to be community for other people too. That is the good and holy work of the church. And this morning as we give, we celebrate that we are a community, that we are God's people living in this place, and the things that we do truly matter. And when we have that and we hold that in our hearts, it is easy to be generous because we see how important the work we do is. May we give with grateful and generous hearts. Will you please stand and join in singing?
the crushing, in the pressing, you are making me one. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking. interesting process. It's not always easy. In case you didn't know, they don't just fall out of the air. God does not beam them down to my computer. There is a lot of thinking and praying, reading and studying that goes into sermons. Some weeks I actually write more than one sermon. Sometimes I write the sermon that's on my heart and get that out of the way, so then I can write the sermon that I probably need to preach. So there are sermons that happen that you don't actually even hear. The hardest sermons to preach are on Christmas and Easter. You know why? Y'all know the story.
story. You've heard it a lot of times. And you're expecting something when you come to worship. When you come to Easter worship, you are expecting to hear a glorious sermon that is full of excitement, right? That's the expectation. So last week for Easter, I wrote three sermons. I wrote the first sermon, which was the sermon that was on my heart. I wrote the second sermon, which was pretty standard, and I just kind of dismissed. And I wrote the third sermon, which you actually heard if you were at 11 o'clock last week, which I hope was a mixture of what you expected with a little twist. Like life, sermon writing is not easy, but it's important work of the church. And for me, the work of Easter happens all year. So we're going to linger, linger in this Easter story just one more week. Um, so I want you to hear again the story of the resurrection. And this is coming from John 20, verses 1 through 18. It should be a very familiar text. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the, tomb, the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw some linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that Jesus had on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a plate by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed, for they did not understand the scripture that he must be raised from the dead, but the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and they do not, I do not know where they laid him. And when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this beautiful scripture that you give to us. And Lord, now open our hearts to your message and your words. Amen. The breaking of dawn on Easter signals the ending of Lent. And for you who know me, you know I love the hard work of Lent. This Lenten season, tears have been very close to the surface. I have felt a circumcision of my heart a clarity that I needed, yet did not particularly want. As with many Lenten seasons, I arrived at Easter morning with a better understanding of who Jesus is and how to be a more faithful disciple. The thing about Lent is while it technically ends at the first crack of dawn on Easter morning, the effects and the processing of Lent lingers in our hearts, as it should. If the work of Lent is going to really last, we need to let that sink in and do good work. So this past Lenten season has been marked more than normal with tears. Tears of sadness, tears of mourning, tears of exhaustion, tears of relief, tears of joy, tears of excitement, tears of proclamation about what God continues to do in my life. Now, if you came to the Ash Wednesday service, perhaps you could have um, thought, wondered, perhaps, that maybe this was going to be a challenging Lent for me. But see, I'm an optimist. And when I was at Ash Wednesday, I was like, I am ahead of the game. 
That was really tough work. So I am going to have a beautiful, easy Lent, and it will be all smooth sailing from here. I'm an overachiever. I got my work done on the first day of Lent. That was not how it worked. Never is, actually, for me. Like many years, the journey was met with unexpected twists and turns. There's a quote that I came across that is attributed to Washington Irvin that talks about tears. It says, There is a sacredness in tears. They are not the mark of weakness, but of power. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. They are the messengers of overwhelming grief, of deep contrition, and of unspeakable love. That quote speaks to my experience of tears. And when I thought about this Easter story in the season of Lent, when I hung on to what is happening in the Easter story, I just found that Mary's tears struck a chord in my heart. Surely her tears were messengers of overwhelming grief and unspeakable love. We know very little about Mary Magdalene. Over time, scholars have tried to pin things on her, I think unfairly. They have asserted that she was the woman caught in adultery, but that is nothing that Scripture tells us. There are only a few things that we actually know about her. She appears in Luke 8 and Mark 16 when it says that Jesus cleansed her of seven demons, which were a sign of her misery, not a sign of her wickedness. In Luke 8, the scripture tells us that she and other women accompanied and supported Jesus out of their resources. And then she appears at the cross of Jesus in all four Gospels. And she is a witness to the resurrection in all four Gospels. We know that Mary Magdalene was close to Jesus, that she was a faithful and a loyal disciple. And we learn the most about her at the tomb In all of her tears, there is a sense of sacredness and power that comes through. When she arrives at the tomb, things are not as she expects. The stone has been rolled away, and she runs and gets two other disciples, and they come back and look, and they go in. But it was Mary that lingered, that sat in the sadness and despair. It says in verse 11, But Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb. She lingered in this hard place. She wanted to understand. She wasn't afraid to ask the hard questions or find uncomfortable answers. I'm not sure what she expected to see in those moments, but I'm pretty sure it was probably not two angels. But the angel said, why are you crying? And in the moment of grief, she spoke her truth so boldly. That's often hard for us to do, isn't it? To speak the truth that binds up our hearts. To sit in the vulnerability of a moment. To risk the judgment of others. After all, she didn't know who they were. She was just a woman living in a time where she was probably not valued as a full person. And these people are saying, why are you crying? And through her tears, she found the power to be vulnerable. And the moment she turned around, she was standing in front of Jesus. Jesus said, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. In that moment, she knew. She was asking for help through her tears. She was ready and willing to do whatever she needed to do. Her tears did not prevent her from doing the work that she valued. She was willing to speak her truth. She was doing whatever was necessary. And in that moment, she realizes it's Jesus in her strength and determination. And all that is happening, Jesus says, Mary. He calls her by name. And it changes everything. He, Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned around, and he, Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Why does Jesus say that? I 
I've kind of skimmed over it, except I was talking through this sermon or this scripture with Wes a couple weeks in her ago, and he said, well, why do you think she said it? And I said, well, I'm not really sure. I haven't given it much thought. And he said, what would you do if the person that you loved was resurrected? What would you do? What would you do? I'd hug them. Wouldn't you hug them? Wouldn't you fall onto them? Wouldn't you say, oh my goodness, this is the person I love. Don't we want that? Don't we want one more hug? Isn't that the thing that we want? Don't we desire that moment with the people that we have lost? I wish there had been like some stage directions. Now Mary steps two sides to the right and hugs Jesus. That would have been easy, right? We don't really have that. And I don't really know if she hugged them. I give Wes full credit for planting that seed in my head. But it seems like a logical answer. There was this moment that you can imagine where the grief was transformed, where there was an excitement, where there was confusion maybe, but everything changed in that moment when Jesus called her name, where Jesus met her where she was and said, Mary. I do love that image. I love that image that Mary jumped and gave Jesus a big hug, an image of celebration and embrace, the moment where tears changed from sorrow to joy. And when she realized what she had seen, that she had seen the risen Jesus, she did exactly what Jesus asked her to do. Jesus said, don't hold on to me. Don't stay here. Don't linger anymore. You have a message to share. Get out there. Get running. Go and share it. Tell the disciples. She became the first witness to the resurrection. You know, the thing is, I don't know if she was still crying when she got there. But when I've been crying a a long time, it's kind of hard just to cut it off in an instant. There's still still some tears in my eyes. So I would imagine that when she made it to the disciples out of breath and excited, that there still might have been tears in her eyes. Tears of joy and relief, tears of excitement, tears of proclamation about what God had done, tears of unspeakable love, tears that words could not express, tears more elegant than 10,000 tongues. Mary reminds us that we come to the empty tomb in the middle of life, that life is filled with emotion and sometimes tears, that the complex nature of life is welcome in the presence of Jesus. I love that. Mary brought everything she had, everything she was feeling, and she stepped into that moment, and Jesus met her just as she was, with tears streaming down her face, with sorrow and sadness, with complication, with all of the chaos that she had been experiencing. Jesus met her where she was. You see, I love that because that's a message for us, that Jesus meets us where we are, that in the complicated chaos of life, the things that are joyful and happy, the things that are hard and challenging, that Jesus meets us there and calls us by name. The story of the resurrection is the good news that Jesus shows up in the middle of the hard places in life, that God loves us so much that God sent his son in the fullness of time to show us how to live, to teach us how to love, to die on a cross, to grant us forgiveness, to be raised from the dead, to open the door to abundant and eternal life, and to stand with us in the hardest places and love us just as we are. That is good news. That is powerful news. That is news that changes our hearts, that sends us in the world to tell the good news to others, that this is life-changing, life-altering, amazing experience that we don't want to hold in, that we go and share. And here's the thing, we go and share it in the middle of crazy life. We go and meet people where they are in their tears, in their sadness, in their joy, and we take this message of proclamation that Jesus meets us just where we are, and Jesus loves us in that moment. And when we can recognize Jesus in the hardest places of life, our tears are changed. We have hope. We have blessing. We have goodness. In all of the emotions of the world, 
we see the fullness of the good news that even in imperfect situations, we serve a perfect God of love who meets us where we are, who calls us by name, who transforms the things that are happening in our life into places that we have the hope to get through. The Easter story doesn't make everything perfect. It doesn't take away the imperfections of the world, but it gives us the hope and the courage and the assurance to go back into the world and all the chaos with a beautiful message of grace and love. Easter is kind of over. In the church, we celebrate it till Pentecost, so we hang on to it to a long time. But if you've gone to the store, they put away all the Easter things. It's all tidied up, and we've moved on to the next holiday. But we are Easter people. We hear this message over and over again, and we go out into the world to be people of hope and grace in the midst of chaos, in the midst of joy and sadness and tears. We are the people that hold this beautiful gospel message. And it matters. It mattered that Mary went and told, and it matters that we go and tell. In the chaos of the world, we hold the power of hope. May we be people who treasure that and give it away any time that we can. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks that you create in our hearts hope that you help us to be Easter people all year long, that you meet us in the chaos of life, that you see us as we are, and that you invite us to a living hope in you. Lord, we give you thanks for all that you continue to do, all the ways that you love us, and all the ways that you give us to proclaim the good news in the world. May we be faithful disciples who run and share the good news with those who are hurting. All this we pray and ask in the strong name of Jesus, our resurrected Lord. Amen.
filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. Lord, go into the world to be peace and love and grace. Go into the world with the good news held tightly in your hearts, but loosely on your lips. And may you be blessed this day and always. Amen. Oh. <laughs> I'm all into worship and I forgot. Can she, can she use your mic? Oh, absolutely. Come she... Thank you. Good morning. Um, I have it here, so I'm going to read from my, my phone. Um, I am here. My name is Sheila Lowry. I am the chairperson for the staff parish relations committee, and I'm here to bring you good news. Here um, today in congregations across Western um, Conference, appointments of pastors are being announced today. The staff parish relations committee is happy to announce that both Pastor Mandy and Pastor Wes will be returning to serve here next year. <laughs> Mandy will continue as our senior pastor and Wes will continue as our associate pastor of congregational care. In addition, we are receiving a third appointment. Beginning July 1st, Justin Snyder, will be appointed as the local pastor for our staff as Associate Pastor of Worship Arts and Missions. Congratulations. His role will continue his ministry of music, worship technology, and will expand to missions and additional pastoral responsibilities. We are very excited that he has been appointed to our clergy and our church and he will continue his ministry here at Forest Hill. Congratulations, congratulations. Yay! 